it's great to see so uh, so many people of you. My name is uh, Yorko Verhul, so I'm with the legacy team of AMI. And um, today we have a great support team in uh, Boyd Brokers from AMI and Julia Karianopoulos. And um, there'll be the technical uh, support. They'll be collecting uh, questions in, in the chat and monitoring everything and supported by Judy Espinosa. Um, today, we have an exceptionally interesting uh, presentation lined up uh, for you. It's a really full program. And we'll be hearing on the importance of movement from Professor Adele Diamond and Ruben Jonkind and Patrick Jonge-Jans. And theirs is an exciting match, deep, deep theory, merit to the joy of movement, improved executive functioning, demonstrated from various angles. Now we've built up a tradition of these AMI talks and we're now ready for the next step. We're going to offer a new service to our worldwide community and that's a Spanish live translation. And for this, we are tremendously grateful for our affiliate Montessori Mexico, in particular, Edward Pedro Cuevas, Judy Espinosa Real, and translator Ana Paola Reyes. And we hope that the slide we circulated in the reminder we sent yesterday has helped everybody in choosing the interpretation channel, if that's what you uh, wanted. So uh, before we, we start with the, the first presenter, um, I'd like to give the floor to Eira Cuevas to say a few words to, to talk about our collaboration, possibly. Thank you, Joe. Well, I, I just want to spread my gratitude to MI for this event. It is very important, really, the connection with MI and having an interpretation in Spanish with this amazing roster of speakers is a great way. Uh, Montessori Mexico knows the great value of Adele Diamond. We enjoy her company in the past few times, always with grace, wonderful humor, and important information in her thoughts. And on the other hand, Ruben and Patrick, part of my great, great Montessori sports family with the mission of contributing with the sport to the Montessori movement. So I'm sure we will learn so much from all of them and we will look for more opportunities like this one. So thank you, MI, for truly connecting Montessori to the world. Okay, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Ada. Thanks very much. And we, we hope that this offering of you know, Spanish translation may prepare the ground for more live translations in other languages. And we do welcome very much your, your questions. Please leave them in, in, in the chat. They'll be uh, collected. And we hope that at the end of the presentation, we'll have a little time to answer uh, a selection of these. Don't worry, this talk is being uh, recorded, as you probably know, so you can always revisit via the AMI YouTube channel or via our website. So now we come to the introduction of Adele Diamond. It's very, very difficult because nothing can really do justice to her. But so I'll, I'll just go back in time a little bit. Uh, on April 10 in 2010, we were, that was the first time that we were able to enjoy Adele speaking because she um, was a keynote speaker at our annual general meeting. And that was revolutionary stuff, if I may so say so. <laughs> so fascinated by her work, we continued reaching out to her and she always responded and uh, joined us for a number of uh, assemblies of the Educateurs Renfrontaire, which I think she really enjoyed. Um, so we guess you all read her bio. Uh, she's a trailblazer in the field of neuroscience. She's, uh, she works at the University of British uh, Columbia. And the term executive functioning, having become a household Montessori, term is I think largely due to the work of providing work with tools of the mind and a recent article in which she professed her sincere interest and fascination for Montessori education can be found in the book Montessori Perspectives. So in very simple language today she'll speak on the importance of movement and the enjoyment of music arts 
and how they contribute to us growing as humans, but she will cover much, much more. And now we're going to listen to my Thank you. Thank you so much, Yoke. That was very generous. Thank you. Let me see if I can do all this properly. Okay, hopefully you can see my slides. Yes? Good. Okay. So first, I'd like to acknowledge with deep gratitude and respect that I have the privilege to live and work on the ancestral unceded territory of the wonderful Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Much of what I'm going to say is written on my slides. The text is there to aid understanding since I speak quickly and to help any deaf attendees. You don't have to worry about writing down what's on the slides. I'm happy to give a PDF of my slides to AMI to share with you. So just sit back and enjoy. Don't worry about trying to write everything down. I worry that activities needed for children to thrive are being cut from school curricula and children's lives. Joy is not the opposite of serious, as any Montessorian knows. Serious business like learning can be joyful. And when you're lucky enough to work on something that you're passionate about, that you thoroughly enjoy, there's no clear distinction between work and play. So I'm gonna say something very heretical, which is that Montessori children spend all their time playing because when they're working, they're totally enjoying themselves. So there's no difference between their work and what somebody else would call play. And research shows you learn more and get more done when you're happy. The most heavily researched predictor of creativity and social psychology is mood. The most robust finding is that a happy mood leads to greater creativity. Specifically, it leads to greater pro uh, creative problem solving. So when you're happier, you're you're able to work more flexibly and to see potential relatedness among things that you wouldn't normally group together. Creativity requires that you feel happy and relaxed enough to be playful. When you're, uh, when you're sad, you're worse at working memory and selective attention. When you're happy, you're better at working memory and selective attention. The arts provide joy because they're intrinsically fun activities and because they build self-confidence, helping them to be children need to believe in themselves. They need to believe they can and will succeed. They're too weak for this. They need to know that you believe in them and fully expect them to succeed. Our expectations for how a child, for a child, have a huge effect on the expectations that child develops for him or herself. And the second group is that children need doable challenges. They need opportunities to do things that enable them to see for themselves that they're capable. It's no good if you keep saying, I think you're capable, but the child never sees any evidence of that himself. The children need to see evidence themselves so they can see, yes, I can do this. Pride, self-confidence, and joy come from seeing yourself succeed at something that you know was difficult. I feel like I'm speaking to the converted. There's so much that I'm saying that Montessorians already know. The best art programs are cognitively demanding. They require concentration, sustained attention, self-control, working memory, and quickly adjusting to the unexpected. In arts activities, children repeatedly see themselves conquering challenges, and that builds confidence. Repeated cycles of fail, keep trying, and succeed, build grit. Grit is the courage, resolve, and tenacity to, to, to persevere against all odds and despite all obstacles, to keep trying when others might give up. It is basically an attitude, a personal creed, that you can conquer anything if you just put your mind and heart to it. El Sistema, Venezuela's national system of youth and children's offices, was started by Jose Antonio Abreu in 1975. I think somebody is not on mute. If you could go on, thank you. El Sistema is intended as a social intervention with music at its core. Abreu envisioned classical music training as a social intervention that could transform the lives of poor kids. LC STEM has provided free. It takes all children, even those who are deaf. It's reached over a million children in over 30 countries and five continents. This is the words of an LC STEM graduate. He says, I see music as a way to rescue children. It's a weapon against poverty. When a child can play an instrument well, it builds his self-worth. He works hard and succeeds. He can then build on that success. He does well in other areas of his life. To me, 
Poverty creates a feeling, feeling of powerlessness, but music creates happiness. The children succeed in making beautiful sounds. This represents hope for families and communities. I would love to see Elsie Stemmer Music and Montessori Education join forces. Their principles are so congruent. For example, community, grace and courtesy in Montessori classrooms. In um, Elsie Stemmer, the whole point is to get good at working together. The primary skill you learn in Elsie Stemmer is not your instrument. The primary skill is working together. It's used in the orchestra as a metaphor for how we work together as a society to become fantastic at working together. Just like in Montessori, they have peers teaching one another. Abra, you said the person who knows three notes is the teacher to the person who knows two notes. And child to child teaching has been found repeatedly to produce much better outcomes than teacher led instruction. And also, just like Montessori would say, never embarrass a child. Abra, you said going wrong is just something you do on the way to going right. Don't worry about it. It just means that you're on the way to success. LC Stemma programs emphasize the joy of playing music, not perfect technique, but playing together and from the heart. If you make a mistake, just try again. We need to let youth know it's okay to make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes, even us. The only way to completely avoid mistakes is to stay with what you already know to stop growing, right? Because if you go beyond what you know, there's a 50-50 chance you're gonna be wrong because you don't know. So if you wanna be sure you're right, then stay with what you already know. But if you stay with what you already know, you're not growing, you're not learning anything. So you need to take the risk of being wrong and making a mistake if you wanna learn and grow. Uh, I, Einstein said, anyone who's never made a mistake has never tried anything new. It's important to try and to keep trying. The arts teach young people that it's okay if your first several, several attempts don't work out. The National Dance Institute, NDI, was founded by Jacques Gamboise in 1976 to transform the lives of troubled youth. Jacques was the best male ballet dancer in the world for three decades and received the National Medal of Honor. He was a high school dropout of poor kids from a poor neighborhood headed for trouble. He just happened to work his, walk his sister to dance class one day and the rest is history. So since dance transformed his life, he figured it might do the same for others. NDI is provided free. It takes all children, even those in wheelchairs. It's reached over half a million children in some of the poorest areas. Youth circus, social circus. Almost 200 cities throughout the U.S. have youth circus programs, as do many in Europe. Youth circus is circus created and performed by youth, as opposed to entertainment for youth. Since the 1970s, youth circuses have used circus arts to instill in young people qualities they need to survive and thrive in society, teaching them the art of life through circus, building character, inspiring youths, especially those at risk. In 2015, I met this young, proud African-American man. You would never guess he was born in prison. His father dead before he was born, his mother dead a couple of years later. At age 15, he was the oldest male in his family still alive and not in prison. He joined Circus Harmony, St. Louis's youth circus program at the age of 12, and it transformed his life. Through his circus skills, he won international awards. And when I met him, he was enrolled in a prestig prestigious circus university in Montreal. These, like many other arts programs, hold children to high standards and children rise to the occasion. Children have a lot of fun and they work very hard. The two are not incompatible. One other example of an arts project that built enormous pride is the book project at Virgin Mary Boys National School and Valley Mongolia that Edwina Mulcahy presented at ESF in South Africa. The project was to publish an anthology of the writings and illustrations of students in grades two to six with the goal of helping the children feel proud of who they are and what they can do. And here you see the books for sale um, uh, uh, um, uh, in 2018. Not surprising, the teachers commented, the children are really enjoying writing stories and poems. They're taking great pride in their work. It's great to see the children excited to work. And that's the special needs assistant saying that. I love the fact that all the stories were brought to life through their imagination and how the children really enjoy writing their stories. 
It's good to read books, but it's even better to read a book that you help write or illustrate. My specialty is something called executive functions. Executive functions have been described as the mental toolkit for success. Research has often found executive functions to be more predictive of academic and career success than socioeconomic status or IQ. There are three core executive functions. The first I'll talk about is inhibitory control. And inhibitory control at the level of attention is focused attention or selective attention. It's uh, the ability to concentrate, pay attention, stay focused, despite distractions, even when the material is boring. We all had a master class in focused attention during the COVID pandemic, when we were trying to work from home with all of the distractions we have in our homes. How can the arts help improve focus attention? To improve any of the executive functions, it's critical to keep practicing that executive function. It's the discipline, the practice that produces the benefits. Not only that, executive functions need to be continually challenged to see improvements, not just used, but challenged. That's true for being excellent at anything. Um, Erickson spent his whole career studying what makes an expert in all kinds of diverse fields. And he found the answer was always the same, 10,000 hours of practice. It's the hours of practice pushing yourself to keep improving that drives the benefits. Well, which arts provide an opportunity to practice focused attention and concentration? Just about all of them. Singing in a round, dancing while balancing something on your head, doing bead work, juggling. When you get good at it, you can make it more difficult. Inhibitory control at the level of behavior is self-control or response inhibition. Self-control is resisting temptations, not acting impulsively thinking before you speak or act. And there's so many occasions when children and us need uh, self-control. To wait your turn, not grab something without asking or paying for it, not eating sweets before dinner, uh, to catch yourself and not uh, uh, step off the curb when the light turns red. Don't blurt out the first thing that comes to mind. Resist acting in the heat of the moment. You know, Don't hit another child when you get upset at the child. Maybe an adult, not press send on an angry email message, but wait. Um, uh, when you're acting, when you're telling jokes, not to laugh at your own jokes. Wait your turn to play. So if you're playing with others, uh, you have to wait till it's your occasion to play. Inhibit acting out of character if you're doing drama. Wait until it's your turn to speak. Discipline and perseverance. Uh, uh, Discipline and perseverance also require inhibitory control to resist the many temptations to quit and not finish what you started. To stay on task despite being bored with it, running into all kinds of unexpected problems, and certainly more fun things waiting for you to do. Continuing to work, though the reward may be a long time in coming, delaying gratification. Evidence indicates that discipline accounts for over twice as much variation in final grades as does IQ, even in university. And the arts build discipline and perseverance in spades, as I've already talked about. Um, uh, uh, Halakwas did a study of the LC STEM program in Philadelphia. It's called Play on Philly. It was an excellent study, random assignment, et cetera, really high quality study. And what he found is that response inhibition and focused attention uh, was much better in the children who were randomly assigned to LC STEMA than the children who stayed in the regular curriculum. And the effect sizes are huge. To see an effect size of 0.5 is incredibly unusual. You rarely see effects that large. And they, the children were also better in English and math if they were in LC STEMA rather than in the regular class. Remember, it's random assignment. The kids were all the same at the beginning. Working memory is holding information in mind and working or playing with it. It enables us to mentally play with ideas and relate one idea to another. Reflect on the past or consider an imagined future. Remember multi-step instructions and execute them in the correct order. It also enables us to remember a question you wanna ask as you're listening to a lecturer or a classmate. Remember the multiple points you wanna make as you're speaking or writing. Remember what you wanted to do after you got interrupted. Maybe someone asked you a question or there's an unexpected noise, and then you have to come back to what you were doing. Working memory is critical for making sense of anything that unfolds over time. 
So that always requires holding in mind what happened earlier and relate that to what's happening now. It's obvious for oral language because you're not hearing what you heard earlier, but it's also true for reading. You're not seeing even a whole sentence at one time. You have to hold in mind what you read earlier and relate that to what you're reading now. Working memory is essential for reasoning and creative problem solving because they require holding ideas and information in mind, relating them to one another and playing with them. The arts require working memory. And if the children push themselves to keep improving, the arts improve working memory. I predict that a great way to improve children's focused attention and working memory is simply to tell them stories. Storytelling should be a terrific way to challenge and improve both working memory and sustained attention, both the telling and the listening. And I'm a huge fan of storytelling. Storytelling requires and invites your rapt attention for extended periods, sustained focused attention, and working memory to hold in mind all that's happened so far, the different characters, identities, story details, and to relate that to the new information coming in. Without the aid of pictures on the page or videos, without any visual aids, you have to hold it all in mind. A researcher randomly assigned children in kindergarten and grade one to storytelling or story reading. In storytelling, the teacher tried to maintain as much eye contact as possible as she was reading from the book, and she never turned the book around for the children to see the pictures. In story reading, the teacher read from the book, and after she finished each page, she turned the page around so the children could see the picture. And what they found is vocabulary and recall improved more in the children assigned to storytelling than in children assigned to story reading. And that's important because vocabulary assessed at age three strongly predicts reading comprehension at nine to 10 years of age. The conversation, the, the give and take that takes place in the context of reading seems to benefit language development, literacy, and brain maturation even more than the reading itself. The critical variable is the number of conversational turns taken. It is talking with the child, listening to and responding, not talking to or at the child that drives the effect. Children who have had more experience, who've experienced more conversational turns show greater activation in the language region and prefrontal Broca's area. And that explains almost 50% of the relation between early language exposure and later language skills. And that builds on a lot of earlier work which showed similar results. So I think story reading is fantastic and you should do it, I'm not saying not to, but I predict that storytelling should improve attention and working memory more because it taxes them more. Um, uh, when Edith Backman was in 10th grade, she emailed me and she said, I've seen that you say storytelling should help improve children's executive functions, but the teachers do that. What would what would happen if the children did it together with one another? If the children read to one another or told stories to one another, would you still predict that difference between storytelling and story reading? And I said, I don't know, why don't we see? So as a high school student, Edith did this study under my supervision. She presented it at two scientific conferences. And what she found is that the mutual storytelling improved auditory sustained attention more than the story reading. And I'm also a big fan of poetry slam and spoken word for the same reason. They, they pull for the same uh, uh, executive functions. Cognitive flexibility is the third core executive function. It involves seeing an issue from different perspectives, thinking about something in a whole new way, seamlessly adjusting to change or the unexpected. It involves having flexibility to take advantage of a sudden opportunity to get around an unexpected problem, to admit you were wrong, when you get more information. An example of poor cognitive flexibility is given by Alexander Graham Bell. He said, when one door closes, another door opens, but we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the ones that open for us. Improv, such as improvisational theater, improvisational dance, and jazz are unsurpassed for encouraging and nurturing creativity. All the visual arts invite and nurture creativity. Arts activities require planning, cognitive flexibility, perseverance, creative problem solving, all of the executive functions. 
for executive function skills or anything else, people improve on the skills they practice. And that transfers to very similar contexts where those same skills are needed. But people only improve on what they practice. Improvement does not transfer to other skills. That is transfer is narrow. That means if you want executive functions to generalize from an arts activity to academic activity, you need to help students see that what they did in the arts also applies to science, math, English, history, et cetera. You need to draw very explicit analogies for students. Don't assume that since it's obvious to you how a skill used in music applies to science, that'll be obvious to your students. Besides helping to develop the self-control and thinking skills in executive functions, the arts also help develop academic skills. Ron Eglish brilliantly uses computing simulations of traditional crafts like beading, weaving, quilting, and hair braiding to teach math and respect for the brilliance in these traditional cultural practices. You can also teach any of these traditional crafts alongside teaching them as co-equals, equal in importance. Rosa Andrews uses beadwork to help teach math to her students of the Lillooet First Nation in BC. And I wanted to show you this short video. Okay, I started beading with my granddaughter, um, who is only five years old, uh, during the summer. And I realized that if someone her age can do it, then my grade threes could also do this. And she, she loved it. She worked so hard. And uh, she didn't tell me until after she was done that she poked herself about five times with a needle because she was afraid I would stop and wouldn't let her bead anymore. Okay, this is um, a, a piece, uh, a beading from one of the students in my class who was struggling with counting by fives. When she first came to my class, she couldn't count by twos, uh, threes, or fives on her hand. And I, I sat her down and gave her some um, um, concrete box to, and we sorted them all out into groups of. Uh, uh, fives, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and I, after I had her count them out, I placed them on a paper and had her write them out, and it was still a struggle for her. But once we started the beading, we started beading, and our beading pattern has five beads, five beads, and she figured it out right away. If I wanted to make a diamond, then I needed to go two yellow, one black, two yellow, and the next row she would go one yellow, three black, one yellow, and then one solid line of black, and then, then she would reduce her pattern to one yellow, three black, one yellow, and then follow with two white, one black, and two yellow to make a pattern. And after she came back to me, like she got so far and she was telling me, Rosa, I can now count by fives, and she counted by fives with me on her hand. And she went home and she told her dad that she can count by fives now. And her dad was so proud of her, he came into the classroom and he told me, she can count by fives. She can now count by fives. And I showed dad the pattern and said he's got to bring mom in. And she's making this one for her mom. Yeah. Um, Native American beadwork um, uh, is not only beautiful, but it, it has within it so much mathematics. Ron English's website provides students and teachers with cultural background on Native American beadwork and the mathematical concepts it embodies. The software allows them to simulate traditional loom designs and create their own virtual designs. And here's the First Nations guy doing it. Our brains work better when we're not feeling lonely or socially isolated. And that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. We are fundamentally social. We need to belong, we need to fit in and be liked. Dan Siegel talks about interpersonal neurobiology because social relations shape and change our neurobiology. People who feel lonely or are focused on anticipating being alone show worse executive functions than people who feel or anticipate feeling more socially supported. A group of researchers gave subjects a survey when they came in the lab and the survey included questions like, do you feel socially supported? Do you feel lonely? And they found that prefrontal cortex functioned less efficiently than those who reported that they felt lonely or isolated. Being socially excluded activates the same brain network as that for physical pain. And the more social pain you feel, the more activity in that network. 
Let's return for a moment to the activities I started with, LC Stemma and the I and Youth Circles. They all build camaraderie and community. They all provide children and youth with social support and a sense of social belonging. In these activities, children are part of an ensemble of dancers, musicians, or circus arts. They learn to help one another, listen to one another, and respect one another. Each is an important part of the whole, of a community. All are working toward a common shared goal. They learn to trust and rely on one another. I love to dance. And in social dance, you're obviously having connection with your partner. The kind of social dance I love most is contra dance where you not only dance with your partner, but the dance moves require that you keep changing partners. So by the end of one dance, only one dance, you've danced with everybody in your line and maybe everybody in the room. It's definitely a social mixing. And it doesn't matter in country dance who you dance with, old dance with young, um, men with men, women with women, black with white, it doesn't matter. Everybody's welcome. Everybody dances with everybody. LC Stemma, remember, emphasizes playing together from the outset versus training alone on your instrument and then joining others. Joint music making involves coordinating one's efforts with those of others. A convincing musical performance by multiple individuals is only possible if it involves cooperation among those playing. When we try to sync with others musically, such as keeping the beat or harmonizing, Research shows we tend to have warm, positive feelings toward those we're synchronizing. Kirshner and Thomas Selling had pairs of four-year-olds interact with one another, either in the context of traditional music activities like dancing, singing, and playing a percussion instrument, or doing similar activities but without singing, dancing, or playing a musical instrument. Immediately afterward, each pair participated in two social interactions to test their willingness to help their partner and cooperate on a problem solving test. And what they found is that joint music making increased their warm feelings toward one another and their subsequent spontaneous cooperative and helping behavior. In circus, you learn to trust others, not to let you get hurt. You learn to cooperate closely with others. In social circus, your age, gender, race, income, weight, body type, background, experience, skill or talent, typically developing or developing differently, do not matter. All are respected. All are united by a common interest in circus and by commitments to try their best and to help and support one another. All are part of one team, one community. Cirque Bijou in the UK features both differently abled and differently abled and able-bodied artists. And one of their projects, Extraordinary Bodies, invites the audience to think about different types of bodies and how they look. While training and challenging executive functions is needed for them to improve, that alone is not enough to achieve the best results. The very best activities for improving executive functions not only work on directly improving executive functions by training and challenging them, but indirectly support executive functions by lessening things that impair them, like stress or sadness, and enhancing things that support them, like joy or feelings of belonging. What activities directly train and challenge executive functions and indirectly support them by also addressing social, emotional, and physical <laughs> needs? What activities touch the hearts and minds of young people, inspiring them, challenging them to reach for the stars, building their self-confidence and pride? Traditional activities that have been around for millennia, for tens of thousands of years across all cultures, storytelling, dance, art, music, and play have been part of the human condition. People in all cultures made music, sang, danced, told stories, played sports, and created beautiful works of art. There are good reasons why those activities have lasted so long and arose everywhere. They challenge our intellect, make us happy and proud, address our social needs, and help our bodies develop. So the arts directly help executive functions by directly training them, like concentration and focus, but they also indirectly support executive functions by increasing feelings of social belonging, bringing joy, increasing pride and self-confidence, and improving physical fitness and motor skills. The distinction between academic and enrichment activities is arbitrary. Critical executive function skills can all be taught through music making, dance, theater, etc. Why not have children do activities they love? If those activities challenge problem solving, reasoning, etc., they should improve those skills more than a class children find boring. 
It may not be enough to have programs where students get to just enjoy the arts, have fun making music together. It may be necessary that they work toward a group performance where everyone is pulling together. No one wants to let the group down and there's a concrete goal to be working toward. The different parts of the human being are fundamentally interrelated. Each part, cognitive, spiritual, social, emotional, and physical, is affected by and affects the others. The best and most efficient way to foster any one of those is probably to foster all. Supporting all the aspects of a child may be key to seeing executive function benefits and seeing them last. The arts do exactly that. Besides directly training and challenging executive functions, they also nurture us socially, emotionally, and physically. Perhaps we can learn something from the traditional practices of people across many cultures and thousands of years. The arts may be critical for achieving the outcomes we all want for our children in school and in life. Okay, that's the end. And I took 31 minutes, so I was only one minute over time. These, these slides at the end are just for you to look at videos later on your own if you want. These are some more videos about the NDI, LC Stemma, and Circus. These are some about um, the benefits of these for getting children out of poverty and for helping children with disabilities. This is some of Ron English's videos, who I talked about. Uh, this, uh, uh, Craig Quatt has a Montessori style of juggling that I thought Montessorians would enjoy. So I have some of his videos here. Um, and then I had hoped to show a 10 minute video in the course of my talk, but I was afraid I might uh, take 30 minutes just speaking. So I put it at the end. If after the Montessori sports people have finished, if there happens to be time, I'll show the video, but I've given you the link. So if there's no time, you can see it on your own. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you uh, so much, Adele. That um, so much <laughs> information has come by. I'm, I'm I'm sure I will have to sort of reconnect to the to the recording um, again. Um, and I know that the, the the videos will be very rewarding uh, to watch the, the the links that you've included at the end of the um, the presentation. And I think you were also happy to share uh, the PDF. Yeah, right. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, people, yeah. So people can write off to us um, and 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 leave their details, so we can make sure they get the PDF. Um, and I'm sure that there'll be lots of questions now, sort of starting to mill around everybody's uh, mind. So, um, again, please leave them in 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 the chat, and they're being collected by Julianne Boyd. So now it's over to. Um, Ruben and 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 Patrick, who are joining us from their football club from Lindom, uh, where they currently are, one floor above the other, as they just explained prior to the meeting. Um, so both of them have a um, a great background in I think athletics, mainly Ruben and football, both as, as coaches, trainers, and analysts, data analysts, and basically they're they're very passionate about movement and 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 sports and um, they both worked actually at the Ajax uh, Youth Academy and when Ruben was working there at, at some stage I can't remember exactly the year must have been something like 10 years ago possibly um, he noticed a young player who was kind of whose behavior was different from most of the cohort he was training with and basically he found out that that different behavior, being cooperative, inquisitive, willing to learn, being courteous, et cetera, was mainly due to his Montessori uh, background. And that sort of became the start of a, lo a lot of conversations with AMI and delving into to Montessori principles of be being inspired by them. Um, this all led to a, um, sports course, sports curriculum that Patrick and uh, Ruben have uh, developed and they're, they're offering globally. They are strategic partners uh, of AMI and um, they also have, you'll probably see that in their presentation, but they also have a keen eye for children in under-resourced uh, communities where they love to introduce sports as a vehicle. 
So it's over to Ruben. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joke, for uh, presenting us and to uh, give us the opportunity in uh, such a, a great environment. Um, also, um, uh, very grateful for the presentation that Adele gave. And I think uh, that we can build up uh, build on, on what, what she uh, said. And um, I think sports is um, a way to, um, to achieve improvements in executive functioning for children, um, just as uh, arts, um, circus, uh, and, and the likes can do. Um, we will dive a little bit further, deeper into um, Montessori's ideas about uh, sports and uh, movement in general. And um, of course, uh, you were uh, disconnected when you were talking about this uh, football player, this boy in the Ajax Academy. Because, because, but it's interesting to mention that that was uh, Jamie Lawrence. And we all know uh, the, the surname uh, resembles to, uh, to our uh, CEO of AMI. And that's how the connection came about. Um, very interesting uh, coincidence, I would say. Um, maybe we could start with. Um, um, a quote of Maria Montessori that was found in uh, that can be found in the absorbent mind. If we speak about uh, sports, and there are some various um, sources where she speaks about sports, and in this particular one, she basically pinpoints um, um, the essence of uh, of sports, and uh, in that way also how um, sports environments can be uh, conducive, can be helpful for. For children and the way that you you should approach this um, in a child-centered way, she says tennis, football, and the like do not have for their sole purpose the accurate moving of a ball, but they challenge us to acquire a new skill, something lacking before. And this feeling of enhancing our abilities is the real source of delight in the game. So in the end, what she says here, it's not really about the outcome of the sport itself, the result of, of something, but it's more about um, improving abilities and uh, through acquiring a new skill uh, building uh, the, the, the character and the and the will of, of the of the child of the person and uh, this is the essence of of how we as Montessori sports see uh, see sports as part of uh, of Montessori curricula school curricula but also uh, uh, as a way to reorganize or reform the way that traditional sports is being taught Another one that's also essential, which is connected to what Adele just uh, explained, is the fact that uh, movement uh, or sports, uh, as you can say, um, is um, a holistic concept. So it's it's both uh, physical, it's psychological, and it's social. And you can't separate uh, the body from the mind. It's not uh, aimed to develop only the body. And um, although it's better to move than to not move. Uh, the concept of physical education is somehow contradictory to this uh, Montessorian idea. Uh, and she also uh, speaks about this, where she says uh, that the, the final research to which the working of the brain, the nerves and the muscles lead up. In fact, it's only by movement that the personality can express itself. As a part of school life, which gives priority to the intellect, the role of movement has always been sadly neglected. When accepted there at all, it has only been under the heading of physical ed education, quote unquote, or games. But this overlooks the close connection with the developing mind. And this is the exact, um, uh, she also is, is very, very clear on this. And this is the way that we, uh, the perspective with which we take on uh, designing our Montessori sports environments. It's about the development of the personality and we use sports as a way to do this. Um, okay. Another one, um, and this is from her lectures in hey. India, thanks to uh, the AMI uh, archive. Uh, sometimes we get new um, uh, material. And this material was released recently, uh, last year, I think. And she says here, it's observed today, which is 1943, that children's movements are in general less developed than in previous generations. This is to be overcome by forcing the child to do gymnastics and at a later stage to give him opportunities for sport. 
well, in 43, I can assure you, uh, the situation was not as dire as it is today with regards to the lack of movement. Today, we have uh, much more problems with lack, with lack of movement. And they even say that uh, sitting is the new smoking. So uh, she was uh, her time, she was way ahead of her times already in that uh, era, um, uh, seeing that these problems were uh, arising. Um, okay. Now, uh, it's in interesting uh, to see, and we will, I will talk about this a little bit later, that we have to connect the planes of development um, with uh, sports. And if we look at sports, sports is a part of our culture. And we know that um, in Montessori, the culture is very important uh, as, a, as a part of an environment for, for children. Um, and we see here uh, that there are different sports and the popularity of different sports. But if we add up all these numbers, and probably there are some crossover between different sports, we can easily see that a big part of the world population has some kind of interest in sports. So it's something that we have to take into account when we design, design our curricula. <clears throat> and in essence, sports then may be a key to educate the human potential. Uh, it's a very nice uh, analogy with uh, the, the title of, uh, of, of Maria Montessori's book. And this is also our, our vision. And we, we believe that this can be um, a way to enhance uh, learning, development of children uh, in a broad way, but also um, to uh, further uh, the ideas that Adele also uh, mentioned but, uh, and, and the Montessori uh, method and philosophy in general and use sports as a force, as a, as a way to uh, to disseminate this knowledge about children. Uh, we also connect, as uh, Joke already mentioned, to the st strategy of AMI through uh, goal one, uh, capacity. Uh, we help to, uh, to uh, increase the range and accessibility of AMI education. With our course, we are already in 76 countries. And it's interesting also to say that uh, around half of the people do not have a Montessori background. So we are also entering into a new um, uh, places, new um, uh, communities. And goal three, it's uh, connected also to uh, uh, extend resources for the families and communities. Um, well, in general, when we um, uh, include sports in the curriculum, that's one. And secondly, with our um, uh, Montessori Sports Fund, we aim to help uh, children in under, under-sourced uh, areas. What do we do? First of all, we bring sports to the Montessori community in a Montessori way. And uh, the last part of the sentence is very important because traditionally uh, there is sometimes some resistance against uh, sports, especially the way that sports is being taught in a traditional way uh, because of the competition and unsafe environments that can exist. And that's, uh, unfortunately, it's a reality. Uh, however, if we... Uh, adopt the Montessori philosophy, we can show, and we have been doing this, that we can create very uh, safe and also very productive environments for children, um, uh, which are uh, designed in a particular way. And what we also do, we connect Montessori to the sports world. Uh, so, um, for example, here in this club, we are implementing uh, Montessori full in a professional soccer academy. Uh, this is very uh, unique, I think. Uh, all the uh, ideas, principles, we are uh, putting into practice here. It's very important that the sports world uh, sees and learns about this because we can uh, help many children and adults uh, to change the environments, to make them more safe and more productive uh, from a learning point of view. If we connect to the planes of development, we know that the um, in the zero to six, um, there is a, a sensitive period for movement. Um, there's the absorbent mind. Uh, so if we uh, create uh, environments where we offer the children different opportunities for movement, um, activities that uh, stimulate uh, the motor control, um, we know that uh, they will absorb this and that will, they will learn this in the most productive way. So in the first plane of development, we offer the fundaments for uh, being able to do sports in a later stage of life. And the control of the body uh, in different uh, types of movements and the control 
of objects that are needed to um, uh, to play sports uh, in in a later stage. Uh, because the children are sensorial explorers, we need to design the sports environment in a way that the senses are stimulated. Okay, in the six to twelve, it's of course different because then the social aspect comes uh, into play, and we have seen in Adele's presentation how um, productive that can be uh, when you um, create environments where children have to work together um, and we want uh, them to be uh, social explorers as well and if we talk about sports we want the children to be able to explore different kinds of sports and uh, of course foremost the sports that are connected to the particular culture where the children are living so in the united states for example we have different sports that are interesting than in india or in uh, for example uh, south africa so uh, we want the children to give environment where they can explore different kinds of sports. Uh, then, because it's the age of reason, we want the children uh, to uh, involve them into the design and the of the activities themselves, that they have to think about why and how they are doing things. And because it's, because it's the age of, of justice, we want them to um, uh, be engaged in creating and, and also uh, living by the rules that they create in the games that they play. Um, in, and also, of course, sports and especially team sports are very suitable for this kind of work uh, connected to the age of justice because they contain in themselves a set of a framework with a set of rules and uh, a common goal in which you have to work together to attain the goal. In the third plane, obviously, it's about uh, developing uh, and transformation from uh, um, the child to the to the adult and there the identity development is very important the personality and because the children have a um, a background from different sports that they experienced they can choose now something that belongs to them as a person they can say i'm a swimmer and maybe within swimming i they can say i'm a, a hundred meter freestyle swimmer or maybe i'm a, a dancer or somebody may be um uh, a boxer or a um uh, a football player depending on what you like you can uh, use the sport as a way to develop your own identity and then hopefully in the fourth plane and further uh, if if the environments are prepared in a Montessori way the children will not drop out which is also a big problem in uh, in modern uh, society where there's a big drop out in the third and fourth plane from sports um, but if if the environments are productive uh, hopefully people will keep on doing their sports and their movements uh, for uh, various uh, reasons, especially health and uh, mental and, and physical health. This is a, a, a short video about... Um, uh, um, sports environment designed um, for first playing children and we just happened to walk by, by there. We can see how this traditionally goes. clear that uh, this is not um, a Montessori uh, environment. Uh, why? Uh, well, the role of the guide and the, the, the coach in this, uh, in this video clip is, of course, very uh, obvious and uh, um, also very strong. Um, and the, the, the environment is not designed for the first plane because the children, uh, they uh, don't understand yet the concept of uh, football, where, there, where you have to give the ball to another uh, person. <laughs> they want to keep the ball for themselves, of course, because it's about themselves. Um, so um, we want them to, um, to work on their own sensorial uh, um, uh, development without hindering them or intervening by uh, language or shouting or uh, 
create a competition element, which is not understood or and also not conducive. Yeah? So we can talk a long time about, about this, but unfortunately, 90%, uh, I would say, of uh, sports environments around the world, not only soccer, but basketball, volleyball, any sport you, you can mention, um, the, the basic tenets are, are like this, a very uh, strong role for the coach, uh, the coach is in the center, and um, the environments are not uh, responding to the needs and characteristics of the children in each different plane. So um, the situation that we um, that we had is uh, what we discussed is uh, why should we get Montessori and sports connected? Well, we already said about talked about this, the, the sedentary lifestyle that, that uh, we need to uh, get more movement in our lives. Um, but there's also an essential role for education to integrate sports as a tool for development of personality and a healthy lifestyle. So it's what I also mentioned along the planes of development, we can build this kind of culture. Um, this is what I also said, uh, we need a child-centered approach to sports training. Um, and, sp and another uh, uh, argument is that sports is universal. So you don't need so much. Uh, you just need, uh, Maybe some some shoes, not even that. Uh, a ball or um, uh, a group of uh, of children, and you can already start. How is the situation currently with Montessori and sports? Well, there are some Montessori schools that have no sports program at all. Then there are Montessori schools who have physical education lessons because sometimes it's obliged by the government. And in these this category, some have the PE teachers. Others have sports teachers or parents without the Montessori education. And some do the PE classes with Montessori teachers. Then you often see Montessori schools that have an after-school program with specific sports coaches hired from the outside uh, and, and who do the, the, the classes. And um, then there's also uh, increasingly Montessori schools that have an integrated sports program that is based on Montessori principles. An example of, uh, of this is, uh, can be found in, in uh, Shanghai, uh, where um, uh, you don't need so much space to do some kind of movement activities for children in the first plane. Uh, this school didn't believe that they had the space uh, until we came there and we challenged them to use a little strip of, uh, of uh, pavement, put their little uh, um, uh, piece of, of artificial turf. And uh, we started by training the guides. So what, what you see here is the, the guides, the Mont our Montessori guides, and they are trained to do this. And the children typically do, uh, um, let's say, uh, 20 minutes per day uh, activities. Um, and um, they um, um, work um, in, in small groups. And the funny thing is that <laughs> it's an anecdote because there is a piano teacher uh, in Shanghai who uh, helps the Montessori schools with piano training. And after a while, she said, mm, what's going on at your school to the school owner? What are you doing, putting in the water there? And she said, why? And then the, the piano teacher responded, well, uh, the children from your school, they learn how to play with two hands much quicker than all the others. And then she started to think, hmm, the only thing that I do differently is ex ex uh, this uh, Montessori uh, movement program. And um, that's, that, that was a big realization um, that uh, this can be a very helpful way, not only for uh, movement, physical, but also to, uh, to help them in the coordination uh, in other areas like music and uh, executive functioning in a, in a general way. This is another video of... Uh, a child, ch children working uh, with a ball uh, in their own rhythm, uh, how many times they want in, the, in, in an ordered environment. And uh, it's interesting to observe uh, these children working with, in a concentrated way um, without any competition, um, uh, tailor made to the characteristics of this uh, plane of development. That you also have to take into account that in China, uh, at least what we have seen in all these years, that not all the children and parents are very, um, how do you say, enthusiastic about sports in the beginning. So it takes also some time to, um, to have the children and, and, adult and parents adapted to the idea that this can be helpful. And, but once you start, they, they see that it helps the children uh, dramatically.
uh, this is not a video about preparing uh, the materials. So uh, we, we found these special balls that have uh, also uh, special characteristics that are very suitable for the children in the first plane. The, the surface, uh, the color, uh, the, the, the size, and um, let's say the, um, the way that they bounce, very, very productive. And the children here, they, they learn how to uh, prepare the ball, to inflate the ball with the pump, to deflate it and to, uh, to take care of the materials. <clears throat> Whereas in the other video, you saw a child kicking against the cone, uh, uh, not, not having learned to respect the material. So um, in our uh, Montessori sports programs, it's not only about uh, football because, well, it's, uh, it's some of the sports that we, uh, we work in, but it's football is just uh, for us interesting because it's a, the biggest sport. But 80% of the participants in our course, they do other, other sports than football. So it's important to understand that it's a broad movement, not only uh, football related. This is, for example, climbing um, we're from Germany, uh, where, where, where children learn uh, uh, to climb in a, um, in a Montessori way. Uh, it's a video of one of our students uh, preparing a climbing environment. Gotcha. So it's different, different uh, uh, kinds of environments. And this is more in a school uh, situation where this uh, school, I think in uh, Scandinavia, where uh, children are offered different stations and they can choose the different um, exercises depending on their uh, interests. And, uh, um, very clear that the role of the guide is uh, different from uh, more traditional PE or uh, sports, more as an observer. Guiding the children, helping the children where they need it, but foremost, creating an environment where they teach the children to do it themselves and to work together if the plane is, uh, is there. Another example is uh, the work that we are doing in, uh, in different countries. Um, in, um, uh, we are working in Mexico and in Thailand with the Montessori Sports Fund, because we said um, when we, I traveled a lot um, for Montessori courses and for football, and uh, I always wanted to, wanted to visit different places. And I somehow got into a, a lot of uh, um, orphanages and, um, what I saw there uh, struck me. Maybe I have selective perception and a bias. I, I think so. But what I saw is that uh, a lot of uh, of those schools, of those children, they uh, they played sports. And when I asked uh, the teachers and the school leaders, they said, yes, well, for these orphans or these children uh, uh, with uh, with needs, they, they really um, uh, use sports as an anchor in their life. What if they have a minute of spare time, they're on the field, uh, either doing uh, basketball or, or, or football or, or another sport. So um, we said, I said at a certain point, well, if this is the case, then uh, why shouldn't we help them? And um, not only the sport part, but also, of course, there's a lack of resources, the Montessori part, but because those things go hand in hand. And in these places, there is often lack of trained people lack of materials, lack of infrastructure. So we said, let's uh, create the Montessori Sports Fund. And everybody who takes uh, the course and becomes a member of Montessori Sports contributes with a small contribution per month to this fund. And uh, well, we started with a, a program in, um, in uh, Oaxaca in, in Mexico, and um, uh, soon to be starting in Thailand with a group of orphanages, schools. And um, um, because, um, well, this is an example from, uh, from Thailand where uh, uh, a girls orphanage, where the girls uh, uh, have a, a soccer team and uh, they're very, very fond of the, of the game. And the, these orphans, they, um, um, they lack proper uh, training, uh, proper materials. 
and the the the, the guides are not not uh, trained in Montessori, obviously. So we have to to support them. This is another example of um, uh, what started in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, where uh, there's also a need of uh, resources and training. And here we, uh, here the children uh, designed their own uh, game. It's a baseball with uh, with their hand, because if they would use a bat or um, or the feet, you see the back. If the ball goes over the fence, it's, there's a big wood, and then you uh, you lose the ball. So they they sort of create their own uh, rules <laughs> and their own game. Um, the nice thing about uh, uh, this um, uh, project in Oaxaca, it's part of a bigger social project. Um, uh, and Carolina Cerezuela, she is uh, she's there to 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 lead that is that uh, the adolescents of that school, they didn't do any sports at all. And uh, because of the program, the Montessori sports program, they started with um, an adolescence program to, um, to organize a volleyball tournament because some of the children apparently liked volleyball. And uh, they basically contaminated the whole community because they organized the, the tournament in the community. And now uh, the local government also supported. They they put a net there and a and a small volleyball pitch, and uh, now uh, the people in the in the community in the in the village they are playing volleyball uh, once or twice per week. So it, it became uh, this sparked and um, lighted up this volleyball movement in the whole community. And so you see that um, things are um, are really going forward there. But of course, the children need balls, different ball sizes, uh, different materials, uh, training. And we, for, for example, we supported them with a special app from the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a very traditional, very high-level volleyball nation, and uh, the coaches have an app, and we help. We uh, take the membership for this app, and then we give this to our uh, uh, Montessori guides, and then they can um, help be helped with uh, exercises and ideas. So. This is an important uh, part of our work that I wanted to mention. Um, well, this is uh, uh, the talk. Um, I hope that uh, you enjoyed it and uh, you could also see the connection between um, uh, the, the work that Adele is doing um, and uh, the work that we are doing uh, and the importance of, of sports in a Montessori way for children and society as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. That was fantastic. Um, and in, I don't think we have lots of questions for you, but mostly sort of comments like how wonderful this is. And I've taken the course and I can sort of see uh, the benefits. So very good, very good going there. And I think there was even a comment of someone hoping to incorporate it into this three hour work cycle so that children could go in and out of the uh, inside environment to go out and do a bit of sports and then come come back in. I I'm haven't sure showed that, that video clip. We, we already did that. So it's already, that already exists. We haven't shown Fantastic. that clip yet, but uh, it exists. Fantastic. Good to know. Um, so, and um, Patrick had to, had to go, but he added in a, a note that he said he would be traveling through Texas in February and March so if anyone is interested in meeting up with uh, Patrick, you're very welcome to. I don't think uh, it was just Texas. I think he mentioned three states. I think he said he would be at three states. He did, he did. Yeah, states. Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. Thank you, Adele. Yes. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then for Adele, um, of course, we got lots of, you know, raving reviews, but also some interesting questions. One from an A my trainer and she writes I recently came across a term enjoyment arousal factor which means that children take the good feelings they have while singing slash making music together to whatever they do next so whether that be academic or social and is this research is this idea supported by research you've come across Interesting. I've never heard that term. Is before. the question? Yes, the question's clear. I've never heard the term before okay. that they mentioned. Um, but it makes ah, sense okay. that um, 
your feelings will carry over. So if you get really bad news and you're feeling really bad, it's hard for you to immediately change your demeanor and be up and happy, right? For the next, and it's the same thing if you're feeling happy. If I'm feeling all excited because I just had this wonderful experience, that happiness is gonna carry over. You don't immediately, when you change context, lose that happy feeling. So it makes perfect sense. I haven't seen the term before, but it makes perfect sense. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then there's someone who's really interested, Adele, what led you to specialize in the importance of movement in education? So what, what triggered everything? What was the path that you walked to arrive at this point? Huh, that's a good question. I'm not actually sure how I first got there. Um, I think part of it has to do with my loving sports and the arts and music. I think part of it has to do with my conception of what improves executive function and the arts and sports uh, fitting so nicely into that because you have to address the whole person, not just work on cognition, but the whole person. In fact, um, I love Ruben's presentation. And of course there was lots of synergy between mine and his, but I would, I would add for Ruben that besides all the benefits he talked about for sports, I would add the benefits for cognition and executive function. It's not just developing the personality. It's not, you know, it's also the very things that the school cares most about, that the students do well, you know, on, on academics, sports will help with. So sports doesn't take away time from academics. It helps you do better in academics. And the same thing for the arts. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um... We've got a question for Ruben here. How do you integrate or balance skills scaffolding? Oh my God, sorry. Scaffolding of the individual with the needs of a large group that is so often required for group support. It's a good question. It's um, thank you, by the way, Adele, for uh, your addition. We will uh, absolutely uh, integrate that in our. Uh, uh, presentations and in our approach um and i think there's also some some research being done already in this field right yes yes uh back to the question um well this is everything it has everything to do with the role of the guide and the design of your uh, activity so if you design the activity in a let's say traditional way where the role of the coach is very crucial to lead the session then you have a problem because then it takes away the, the, the focus for you to observe. So you need to, uh, especially in group work, you need to involve the children in uh, designing and leading the activities. And if you do that, things get into a flow and then you can go out with your, you being an expert or uh, an observer, observe and then intervene in an individual way. Because then only when you observe, you know, uh, what might be a structural or pattern or a problem or a challenge and then you can um, approach a child individually so it's uh, uh, the, the design of the prepared environment that is crucial to be able to do this in a good way it's a little bit abstract but uh, once we have some practical examples and you, you work this in, in practice you will see how it works okay um Apparently, there's lots of other questions coming in, but we probably won't have time to, to cover all of them. We'll just select one or two. Um, and I got one question through, uh, through Julia. Um, how to apply these programs of art in communities and not just schools? That's a good question. Um, you need, you usually need some organization or some structure of some kind, a community center or something. Um, I, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. Um, you could imagine that you could have training of music teachers and, and sports coaches, and then they could go off on their own. There are many ways you could implement it, and I haven't given that enough thought. So I apologize, I, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> 
Um, there's another question from Ruben, which I think kind of overlaps with the three hour work cycle. It says, can we assign time for sports? Will it disturb other children while hmm. working in class? Yeah, um, good question again. Um, there's, if you look at the, the older pictures of uh, Montessori environments, when she was, for example, in Spain or uh, also in Italy or in Belgium, you see that there was also like a very smooth transition from outside and to from inside to outside. So the outside part, the outdoor part of the of the school was also being used as an environment. So if there's possibilities to do that, weather wise and uh, infrastructure wise, you can create something that, uh, of course, is, has good limits and is safe. And then there's no uh, disturbance. Otherwise, there's also possibilities to uh, create something inside. And of course, uh, you have to look at your infrastructure. But there, uh, my experience, uh, I've seen many schools, is that people believe that it's not possible until you uh, make it possible and you you, you use a hallway or uh, another uh, piece of the building that is, uh, is suitable and that doesn't uh, disturb from a noise point of view or a, that's even a point of view of balls <laughs> going through the... Uh, through the through the classroom and stuff like that so it's it's possible to do that with some creativity and uh, uh, and some um, uh, perseverance yeah and i think we've got one final question to 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 wrap on again it's for montessori sports and that has to do with the, the competition question mm. as you can uh, imagine roman mm -hmm. and the question is that that person works with students some students that have a strong attraction to competition due to their environment society mm -hmm. family mm -hmm. friends and what would you recommend what would it would be the best way to to go around this to yes it's always a good question and uh, what we have to strive for is uh, because competition uh, in itself is not a bad thing rivalry is uh, is moral progress as Mont montessori herself said com compared to uh, to a, a situation where there's not where there's none uh, the only thing is it needs to be about competition with yourself and uh, the good quote is from uh, steve curry uh, the basketball player who also uh, is montessori child and he says he loves to uh, be challenged by the by the competitors by the other team because then he can improve himself so we have to get this narrative uh, we have to uh, load this narrative with with the children that's one and secondly, it's also about our environments that we prepare. Uh, we can prepare environments that are, are um, uh, stimulating internal competition and group work and group uh, productivity and who are uh, that are not uh, stimulating competition from team A against team B. It's very, very important to design the, the environments in a good way and also if competition exists, which is also part of life, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It should be like that. It should be that sometimes you win, sometimes you draw, and sometimes you lose. So then the environment is fair, so to say, in a moral moral uh, uh, perspective of the word. And that and this is, uh, yeah, of course, you need some some training and experience how to design these uh, these environments. But it's very possible to do this in in this way, as we are proving in this. Uh, very competitive uh, environment uh, here. I, I'd like to yeah. add something if I can. I always loved sports, but I was a reasonably good athlete. And sports are, are a lot less fun for the kids who were the last one picked to be on a team, who aren't so good as the others. Um, and so I, I think um, that there needs to be some way that everybody can feel like they're succeeding um and part of that is what ruben mentioned that you you're competing against yourself so even if i'm the weakest one in the group if i'm better than i was last week i've i've, I've succeeded um but i think also if when they're young in the first plane if there can be more opportunities where they have to collaborate where competing just won't work if you want a good success you have to work together i think that can also help to emphasize the, the, the every one of us makes a contribution. And if you're missing just one, even if he's the uh, weak link, you're not gonna do as well. 
So we need to help all of the members of our team and encourage all of them. Yeah, excellent point. Thank you so much for for that very valuable addition. Um, I think we're going to 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 wrap up now. Um, I, I thank everybody for for staying on. Um, this was hugely interesting, and it was a superb privilege to have Adele, Ruben, and 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 Patrick uh, join us. We will be following up. We will be sharing Adele's PDF. We will consult with uh, Ruben if there's any material that he can share absolutely with uh, with the audience and yeah thank you so much